Now, um, uh, if we look at all the uh, drugs we have here, this list is similar to what was on the video. And there's very nice pictures there, like the animations and so forth. Basically, the way we're designed is uh, we have two systems. We have the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. I call them the openers and closers. You've got door openers and door closers. If something opens a door, the other system closes it. If one closes it, the other system opens it. For instance, um, if you have the uh, beta adrenergic uh, drug for asthma, albuterol. If anybody, I don't know if anybody's here on an albuterol inhaler, but that is a beta-2 adrenergic, a sympathetic or sympathomimetic drug. And in the windpipes, it's an opener. So it opens windpipes. Now, the cholinergic system, parasympathetic, would close windpipes. So if you block the closer, you get an opener. And so many of the drugs that are available are anticholinergics. So if you have an anticholinergic, you've got an opener. If you have a proadrenergic, you have an opener. And so many people are on both. Uh, if you have ever taken Combivant for your asthma, that combines a parasympathetic drug, a, sympathetic, uh, a parasympathetic blocker, a sympathetic stimulator, you get a double whammy with Combivant. And that principle is in our CNS uh, as well. You have stimulators, you have blockers, and if you block a stimulator, you get one thing. If you stimulate a blocker, you get another thing. It's sort of like in your driving, uh, when he was trying to explain here about you know, how one thing stimulates and it gives you relaxation, you can think of it as putting the brakes on your car. If you're stimulating the brake, what do you get? You slower, right. You slow the car down by stimulating the brake. You can also go faster by some accelerator or blocking the accelerator. If you block the accelerator, you slow down or stimulate the brake. Either way, you've got a double thing here, and that goes on in the brain. So every time you think about that, openers, closers, stimulators, uh, blockers, they're all designed into us. And so pharmacologically, anything we do is designed right around those things to make one work better, block another one. Now in the stimulants, the methamphetamine you mentioned there is a far bigger bang. And it's, it, I, obviously, it's not put cocaine out of business. But if your brain is interested in stimulation, meth is the place to go. Uh, it will do it uh, more and better than cocaine. And uh, uh, I'm sure if you talk to enough users, you'll, you'll find that out there from their own testimony on that. Does it ruin you forever? Well, I don't know how many of you know Libby Comby in Polk County. You met, have you met Libby? Okay, Libby's uh, come to the bridge. She's spoken to the girls at the uh, Auburndale Bridge. And you talk to her, I mean, she's like a normal person. Well, she was a 20-year meth head. She is the president and founder of Mothers Against Methamphetamine, Mama. And uh, so tell your people, your brain is not necessarily gone. Now, you may not make Mensa. You may not get to the final round of Jeopardy. But you probably can have a normal life after meth. And nicotine, uh, one of the most difficult to get off of. Uh, I wish it were easier. I wish there was some magic bullet. People do nicotine for a reason. I mean, he, he says it's useless. Well, yes and no. If it were completely useless, I mean, why would anybody smoke and pay $5 a pack? Uh, it does two things. First, it, it does block withdrawals because nicotine does have a prolonged withdrawal. The, uh, the physiological withdrawal may last two weeks and the psychological withdrawal much longer, uh, months or years. But unfortunately, the things that go with it are bad. Uh, and the drug is extremely toxic. People probably have no idea because it is legal and you can buy it in a, con in a convenience store that it's not bad. Uh, one of my patients, who is an entrepreneur, is um, manufacturing the basic nicotine for e cigarettes. E cigarettes are those which are heavily advertised in various uh, publications and so forth. The government doesn't quite know what to do with them. The FDA wants to regulate them, but doesn't know how at the present time. Is it a device, as it's an electronic device that actually atomizes the nicotine? It's not a product of combustion. Um, when you smoke a cigarette, a cigar, you get a product of combustion. 
you get carbon monoxide. When we do our research studies on smoking, we measure uh, exhaled carbon monoxide levels. That shows you've been breathing in something that was burning. And so you breathe out what was burning and it registered on, on a machine, carbon monoxide meter. The e-cigarette doesn't do that. Uh, so you don't have any combustion, you have atomization. So when you, if you see someone at a place, not really smoking one, they're inhaling it, uh, comes out there. But the nicotine concentrations can be much higher than cigarettes. And so these people are getting a buzz off their e-cigarettes. It's a much higher thing. And he has to wear uh, acid-proof gloves to make this stuff up. The nicotine is extremely toxic, very dangerous to work with. Uh, he hasn't killed himself yet, but knowing this man, I won't be surprised if I read about it in the paper. Caffeine. Um, lots of our people here have hepatitis C. Uh, another side effect of drug addiction, if you will, uh, injection especially. But caffeine has been found to be very beneficial for hepatitis C. At least five cups a day uh, of caffeinated coffee has been proven beneficial in maintaining these people. So if some of these people are drinking coffee, that's not necessarily a bad thing for them. The uh, sedative hypnotics, um, when you combine these, many people combine them all. They got the benzos, they have opiates, and then they drink. All these people are still standing, if it weren't for tolerance, boy, they'd be all out. And the combination is bad. In fact, many of these drugs combine. I uh, have uh, a very sad case right now, uh, my executive, not this executive director, different executive director. <laughs> Thank you, yeah. Uh, a different executive director, uh, whose son was involved in an automobile accident uh, a couple of years ago. And he was uh, 22 at the time, and he was with his first cousin. They grew up together, they were the same age. They did everything together. Uh, grew up in the Panhandle, now living in Lakeland, and got in an accident as a result of partying. They were partying using cocaine and alcohol. And uh, his, it was his cousin, which was, who was his best friend, at the same party. He was so wasted he couldn't drive at all. So being the other designated driver, uh, he drove his cousin's car, got in a wreck. The cousin, of course, being blasted away, was not wearing a seat belt, and went through the windshield and was killed. Uh, I guess say same age. This has made a huge rift in the family. Uh, his blood alcohol level, this is the driver, was 0.06, which as we've seen here, actually in Florida is the same 0.08, is below our legal limit here. But there was cocaine in the urine. Now you get a combination effect here called cocaethylene when you combine cocaine and ethanol, which is our drinking alcohol. And it's an additive property thing. And so they charged him with vehicular homicide. And um, I won't go through the two years that he was in jail and all this other stuff. And I, I actually pled for him to have treatment and so forth. But they gave him 10 and a half years uh, uh, at a reduced charge of uh, DUI manslaughter. Uh, sad combination. He didn't have that much cocaine. He didn't have that much alcohol. But you put the two together, it was lethal. And the same with the benzos. I just call benzos prescription booze. They work the same way. They have the same thing, you don't get the hangover. So if someone's doing Xanax and alcohol, look out, find out where they're driving and don't be near them. Uh, cannabis, ah, what a controversial subject. Just this week, uh, this is in the news all the time, just this week, there was an article on how the, uh, you now have dueling agencies of the uh, parent organization called the uh, American Society of Addiction Medicine is now battling against the California Society of Addiction Medicine. This was in the paper uh, yesterday. Uh, headline San Francisco, Addiction Doctors Restate Anti-Marijuana Stance. Well, as you know, there's medical marijuana in California. And medical marijuana basically says if you feel you need ma uh, marijuana for your medical condition, you can go to a doctor, he can write you a note. It's not a prescription, but it is a note saying that you have a condition that is eligible for medical marijuana under the state statutes of the state of California. 
uh, these are basically head shops that have prong up doing this, and they're, uh, they're all over the place. And in the cities, especially San Francisco, uh, they're everywhere. I mean, and there are long lines of people waiting to get their marijuana and showing them a little slip of paper that says they can have it. Now, this is problematic because marijuana is considered a uh, class one drug called Schedule One in the federal government. Well, that makes it very difficult to do anything with marijuana because Schedule One is the same as heroin and any other drug which the uh, federal government deems to have no medical purpose. Yet, Marinol, which is a prescription drug, Dronabinol, for nausea and vomiting, chemotherapy, and other indications like that, which is a pill, uh, can be legally prescribed. And it's the THC in it that is the active ingredient. You will test positive on your drug screen if you take Marinol. So uh, that runs them afoul of the federal laws, makes it ever, very difficult for medical review officers, who are the people that, like myself, who read drug screens. Um, what do you do with these people? They don't have a prescription exactly. It's against federal law. If you're in a regulated industry, such as DOT or something like this, you've got to find them positive, but they have this note. Well, so what the doctor is doing out there now is when the doctor gives them the note for the marijuana to get it at the shop, they also give them a prescription for Marinol so that they can have their Marinol script, show it to the doctor, get passed on their drug screen because it's a legal uh, reason to have the, the drug in them. They'll test positive for marijuana uh, while they're choking on the outside. Um, this has become a major problem nationally because what do you do with this stuff? Uh, I mean, is this the worst drug in the world? Is it the best drug in the world according to the people who are using it? Um, I, I will say it is indeed addicting. That 9% figure, it is addicting. It does have problems with driving. Um, and even the California Society of Addiction Medicine, which uh, put out a position paper on this in California one year ago, and this is, was put up to the electorate, and this would be completely legitimizing it. This, um, uh, would take all of the legal things away. It would be regulated just like alcohol. It would be licensed and regulated. Well, that went down to defeat about two to one. So when put to the public in California, they still found it no. Now this was put up to the vote in Nevada five, six years before that. You can do anything in Nevada. But they voted that down two to one. And this is again a referendum of the public, not the legislature. Uh, the California Society of Addiction Medicine did put out a position paper on this, and they, uh, uh, at that time, were not in favor or disfavor. They took a neutral position on the law as it was written for the referendum. But they did uh, put down a voter sheet, and this is a copy of the voter sheet, so people could look at it and see what they were voting on whether marijuana would be legal or illegal. It says, the normal brain relies on the same cannabinoid chemistry found in marijuana to regulate much of the body's physiology. This is again the principle that, same with the opiates, we have endorphins in our body, we have endorphin receptors, and what if you just beef them up with roxycodone? Now, you're gonna get more than a runner's high if you take roxy. And so, but that, what it means is the receptor is there. This cannabinoid system that they found uh, some years back is where the marijuana goes. There is a system that. Uh, if you take Chantix to uh, stop smoking, Chantix is a cannabinoid system blocker. So cigarettes go to the uh, same place uh, as far as a receptor, and this is a receptor blocker. It's kind of a generalized cannabinoid system blocker, so that's why you get some strange side effects from Chantix, including uh, very vivid dreams and uh, some psychic phenomena. Uh, I will say it has the highest percentage of quitting of any of the things we have now. Uh, and that highest percentage is still maybe 30. Uh, we did research on the nicotine, um, well, it was going to be called NICVAX, if it already made it to market. Uh, a small company in Washington, D.C. Uh, called um, NAVI. It specializes in making vaccines, and they made an anti-nicotine vaccine. And we'd have the people come in, these are all smokers, they had to have a significant amount of carbon monoxide in their 
when they blew in the machine, which they did, we, <laughs> we had some real puffers that came in. Uh, I'm surprised, you know, 700 is uh, lethal, or 70 some is lethal. We had people blowing 47 on their machine. And of course, we didn't have any smoke in our building. They're in the waiting room for a while. The carbon dioxide levels do eventually go down, and they're still blowing very high levels. Uh, they had to want to quit, and they would get an injection, either placebo injection or NICVAX once a month. This would go on for six months. Theory was great. You have a nicotine molecule, you give this vaccine, you make an anti-nicotine antibody, it latches onto the nicotine molecule and it's too big to get across the <coughs> blood-brain barrier. Well, it was a nice idea. Unfortunately, it didn't work at all. Uh, the the <laughs> smokers smoke, what can I say? Uh, the uh, NICVAX people had identical smoking rates to the placebo people. And Interestingly, uh, you know, three or four percent of the placebo people quit. Three or four percent of the people that are in neck vax quit. Um, the cocaine vaccine is bit basically the same dust. They working all, also on a cocaine vaccine would be the same idea. Uh, I'm not sure why it doesn't work. I was a lot we don't know about the brain. It didn't work at all. I thought it sounded good, but it wasn't. The hallucinogens. Um, recently, they just did another experiment. This is what we discussed uh, last week, duplicating what went on when I was in school. And this is with psilocybin, hallucinogen. Hallucinating is seeing things that aren't there, hearing things that aren't there, and so forth. Well, uh, now why you'd want a drug that made you have that? Most people come in, and I try to treat them, and that's a complaint. Here they go and pay money to get it. That, what can I say? Uh, this is the magic mushrooms. Um, and so you take this and you get these weird things. And you also get a heightened sense of color and all this stuff. And uh, in my medical school class, and of course you have to remember, going back to your talk on the various times there, if you look at that first picture there, the uh, flower power and all this stuff, and Vietnam War and everything's going on, and that's when I was in medical school. And so, um, Drug use was fairly liberal on campus, and uh, they had this experiment for the medical students to volunteer for, to take psilocybin, this is the Department of Psychiatry, that's one that couldn't diagnose a hypothyroid case, uh, were <laughs> going to give them this, and then they would give them these pictures of color wheels and stuff like this. And uh, I wasn't doubting my sanity or anything, but I said, well, you know, I've heard that, you know, if you took one of these drugs, like LSD was very big then, um, window pane, micro dot, all these uh, things are going around at the time. Uh, if you were like, had a, just a hint of psychosis in your somewhere, this could bring it out. And I didn't want to go, go wacky my first year in school. So I said, no, I don't think I'll participate in that one. Well, almost everybody else did. Uh, I don't know if they went wacky, although one of them did go into psychiatry. And uh, is, I, I saw him on one of my computer things last week. He's still around. He took this stuff and uh, got these weird feelings and all that. And they had a blast. They had a good time. Uh, of course, we also had a beer machine in our house, too, so I don't know if that was before or after. It's still around, and they've just done recent experiments on this, giving this to, uh, again, uh, so-called normal volunteers. And they... Uh, expressed a improvement on their openness scale. Now, I'm not sure what this uh, means, and I don't know if you know, being really open is good if you're shy and you have you know, uh, social anxiety disorder or something, and you take uh, psilocybin and you increase, it was like 2.5 points or something, it didn't seem like a big increase to me. On your openness scale, this made you better at parties or something, I don't know. I don't know what they're trying to get at, but they felt it was a big thing. It was a medical headline two weeks ago. So it's still around, psilocybin mushrooms, and it's still around. Now the dissociatives, the dissociatives are a little bit different. They're, um, uh, we're talking about with the Robitussin. Now, who could get mad with Robitussin? I mean, this is the mother's friend, right? I mean, you give it to your children, all this stuff. Um, there are other uh, drugs in this group, uh, PCP, Noted from uh, mostly a West Coast drug, of California fame. Uh, ketamine. Ketamine is an anesthetic. 
again, abused. Uh, we don't hear too much about it, but it is abused by medical professionals. Uh, dextromethorphan, uh, nitrous oxide falls into two different groups here. And the drug you've heard more about than any other drug now is, what's in the news now? Michael Jackson trial? Propofol. No, who ever heard of propofol uh, until this happened? <laughs> Nobody heard of propofol except physicians who are hooked on it. A very large number, percentage of physicians hooked on propofol. Diprovan is the brand name. Uh, my wife shoves Diprovan in people all the time. Uh, it's a great anesthetic. It puts them out, it paralyzes them. A and if you have had every bone in your body broken, I, and she had a guy this, this last week, only two bones in his body not broken, run over by a truck. You joke about it, he was run over by a truck. The, Diprovan, propofol, give it to them. Now they're all in a ventilator so you can't kill them. They're obviously in an intensive care unit being highly watched. The drug is extremely potent, very dangerous. Um, I'll be interested, the trial is going on, the closing arguments as we speak right now are going on in that trial right now. So a jury is going to be deciding whether propofol is eh or eh. Uh, but physicians abuse it right now. And uh, mostly anesthesiologists, of course, they have access. And, you know, a little propofol for you, a little propofol for me, you know. And, uh, you know, who, who's to know the difference in your ventilator? Uh, we'll see how this one comes out. Also, by the way, anesthesiologists, the highest professional group hooked on opiates. Same thing, morphine. These patients are on morphine, morphine drips and all that. And uh, same thing, if you're out of it, uh, you're not asking the nurse, you know, did I get my full dose of morphine? You know, they don't know. Nurses also, by the way. Um, in fact, I had a nurse, um, got her script refilled this morning, as a matter of fact, just before I came in here. Um, the inhalants. These are hard, thing, and people can die on this stuff. If you've read, what, 25 different things, you know, list, you know, list. If you want the full list of what you can inhale, go to Lowe's and go into the, you know, the paint department, the solvent department, and so forth, and just take down probably more than 25 things you can inhale there. And, and I remember uh, when I used, to, I used to be a paint chemist, and uh, I worked for Sherwin-Williams. And we used toluene, it's another one of these inhalants, to clean all the brushes this is in the research lab, all the brushes, and we use xylene and toluene, and they bring in 10,000 gallon tank cars of this stuff, but we used it in our lab, and you had to put these big gloves on and everything with this stuff, but it was in open uh, sinks full of toluene. Well, you couldn't help but breathing this stuff in. And it was nice, I admit. <laughs> it, it was, I mean, it smelled really nice, and I went, Mm, you know, this was, it was sweet and it was kind of nice. And uh, basically, you don't want to stand around that sink too long, you know. <laughs> um, and then I got, the other thing was in, this, in the uh, surgery training, uh, was um, some other stuff. What was that? It was a, a, a skin glue. I definitely got away from it because it was a similar smell. It's one of these what they call aromatic hydrocarbons. These are all in that general group. Aromatic hydrocarbons is the general group. And, um, and I had a guy who was 15 years old who was a huffer. He was a gasoline huffer. And you take the, get a uh, rag of this stuff, put it in there, and then put it up there. And the problem with the huffers is that, uh, obviously, you have no idea what you're huffing. Now, when you put gas in a car, they ring up a bill. But when you put gasoline in here, there's no meter. And so you don't know when the tank is full. And sometimes these people have fallen down passed out with the stuff, on them. They're on the ground. Guess what? They're still breathing in. They're unconscious huffing. They're dead. They didn't know. They didn't plan it that way. But they're dead from huffing. So this is not a minor thing. People do this to get, get high again, and they can go out with it. Um, so all those fuels, all those other things uh, do it. Now, had any of you, when you were, I won't say you're doing it now, but like when a small child ever spin around real fast, turn around and see if you can make yourself dizzy? You were all getting high. 
you were all getting high. And it's true. You do this, and it's a different feeling. It's spinning around you like this, you know, and you'd be laughing and fall down on the ground and you watch the ceiling go around. There's psilocybin, okay? Okay, same thing. So again, all these drugs, they're duplicating various things that are already in us, whether it's the cannabinoid system, the opiate system, uh, the mu opioids. Uh, one of the dirty little secrets of opiate addiction, of course, is that there are other receptors uh, not mentioned. The kappa receptors are in your colon and intestine and elsewhere on the body. Uh, these people are all like terminally constipated and it's bad, it's very bad. Um, plus, uh, talk to the men and you'll find out that uh, the chronic opiate users all have low T, okay? It really lowers testosterone. Uh, so uh, the men who are doing this uh, get some things that they wish they hadn't gotten, but uh, they may keep on using it. Now, this uh, man here is Kurt Angle, who is a uh, winner of the 220-pound uh, heavyweight class Olympic champion in 1996. Um, tremendous athlete. He went on to WWE, became a professional. Uh, they don't have seasons in world wrestling. It's year-round. There's no off time. It takes a tremendous toll on the body. He did this for years got the champion, got the big belt and everything for that. A lot of injuries and ended up hooked on oxys. And uh, it said here that I was taking 65 extra strength pills a day and it wasn't enough. 65 and it wasn't enough. Uh, the uh, WDE officials found out about this, of course, especially Chairman Vince McMahon, it's in the news a lot, uh, ordered him to quit his addiction and his erratic behavior, uh, and this is obviously the company, this is owned by a company, it's like if somebody owned the NFL or owned the NBA, and they ordered him to quit. And he went to the doctor and the doctor said, ease off these, you know, wean down gradually on your opiates. He went cold turkey, uh, suffered the full withdrawal, and came back, and he'd used everything else. He said he used everything, he used growth hormone, steroids, opiates, uh, you name it. Uh, although he denies any alcohol problem. Now, he is training for the Olympics again. And if he makes it, uh, not probable, but if he makes it, he would be the oldest man to ever win a medal in Olympic wrestling. He's uh, 43 now. But he did quit. There's another man here to show that I, I always like some success stories. This is in Parade Magazine a year ago, and I, I keep this in my office because some people figure that, you know, if they've gone so far, it's, it's over, you know, my, my life's ruined, I'm, I've got nothing left, uh, my family's deserted me, uh, the kids, you know, we've had people come in here, of course, had no clothing, they had to borrow clothing, um, borrow shoes, just to be here. This man, who is a public defender in... Um, so Massachusetts, New Jersey, anyway, his name is Dyer, Mr. Dyer. And he's an attorney. He is now an attorney. And he's uh, 58 years old, and it says here, at his lowest point in the mid-1970s, going back to our 70s picture, he stole cars to finance his 48-bag-a-day heroin habit. That's a heavy habit. Most people can't afford that today. I mean, you gotta steal luxury cars uh, due to this one. When not in jail, he bobbed from halfway houses to detox centers to basements where he slept next to boilers to keep him warm. He says, I was hopeless, helpless, penniless, and crippled by drugs and alcohol. He bears the scars in his arms from years of knee use. I was sick from despair and desperation. He still mourns the loss of close friends who died from overdoses and shootings. And he said it was his background that made, him, uh, made me let down my guards, says 23-year-old Jeremy Keene, who had multiple run-ins with the law but is now sober and employed. I thought, I can turn around if this guy can turn around. He has helped many, many people since then. And he's up for potential judgeship. That's why this made the newspaper. He could become a judge. He obviously got a, uh, a governor uh, pardon in the standing of Massachusetts. Um, 
The point is that even with all these chemicals, you know, all these things going on, and you can bash up your brain, you can bash your body and so forth. If you are alive, there is hope. If you are alive, there is hope. I've seen some people come back with some really bad things that you'd say, well, you know, don't do this because you know, your brain will look like that scrambled egg on TV. Um, even the scrambled egg has nutrition in it, okay? So do not give up on these people. Uh, the pharmacology, what will they think of next? You know, some robo combination, you know, something else. Uh, but the point will be the same. The point will be the same. They're either trying to escape or treat something or do something. And that's what we need to help them with. And, and the attempts to find some other drug that blocks these drugs, a vaccine against these drugs, and so on and so forth. You know, I'm not opposed to the research. Fine. But I haven't found anything that's really super out there. You know, that will just turn this around and just say, turn it off and say, you take this pill, you're not addicted anymore. It uh, hasn't been there. And I worked with methadone and suboxone for 17 and nine years. And they have their niche. These are niche players in the game. But this is no cure either. This is no panacea. And I think that uh, what's going on here needs to be amplified many times over. Thank you.